so much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com on July 30th, 2008. Oh, my God, run for your lives. Jessica, does that look like a path to you? No. It's a great story, a town lost in time. Both you guys are no fun. You know that it's unlikely that we're actually going to find anything, right? I think that we're getting really close to Okay, Terry. When you go looking for the truth... Give me the map. Beware. There. You might find what you've been searching for. And the chosen one is Stephen Chandler. Tomorrow I will be offered as a sacrificial meal. They're gonna eat you? Not them. Okay, who's gonna eat you? The lair has been disturbed. We'll have to make a sacrifice right away to keep him from coming after us all. The prison cell is empty. Oh, oh. my God. I'm going back to that town. That guy Stephen saved your life, and Hope saved mine. So I'm going back there because if there's a way to kill this thing, I'm going to find it. Ogre. <laughs> I love that. Uh, that was from. A, that's a trailer for a movie called Ogre. Anyway, uh, whether it's Ogre, Shockwave, Fire Serpent, Komodo vs. King Cobra, Hallowed Ground, Secret Lives of Second Wives, or, of course, Loch Ness Terror, it, really, it doesn't matter whether you've seen or even heard of these actual movie titles because they're providing a profitable existence for Paul Hertzberg, pro- president and CEO of Cinetel Films. Movie fans focused on the weekly top ten movies and their box office take are missing an entire dimension of the film business. That's where independents such as Cinetel operate, cranking out movies largely on the fringes, but with enough familiar elements as to tempt the casual movie renter. Today we're going to find out from Mr. Hertzberg himself how, this part, how his part of the business operates and thrives. So, Paul, welcome to Mr. Media. Glad to be here. Glad to have I, you. I chuckled when I heard the trailer. I said, that sounds familiar. I actually know that movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, is, is, now, that's, I'm guessing that that's a pretty recent one because that's up on your website right now, right? O- Ogre was a Sci-Fi Channel premiere uh, hmm. about in February. And actually, if I recall, it was actually one of their highest rated movies this year for original premieres. Wow. So you, you must be very pleased with that. Anytime the people we work for are happy and get good ratings, we're happy. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, tell me first of all, tell me a little bit about the the history of Cinetel. You've been around, I think, or the company's been around at least since about 1980. 1980. Yeah, we're old. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> or both of us are old. But uh, we started in 1980 back in Chicago, where I was originally from, and started doing television specials, entertainment specials. I like produced for HBO and did like the Fifth Dimension in concert and um, gosh, Aretha Franklin in concert for Showtime. And when the video boom started, probably about 1983, we segued from music shows into um, feature films and genre action feature films. And I think our first one was The Tomb with John Carradine back in 84. And then we went into Armed Response with... Um, Lee Van Cleef, which I believe was his last movie, and David Carradine. And it went out theatrically, but the big money came in in video at the time. I see. And is there... That that was the beginning. Go ahead. That was the beginning. And we moved out from Chicago to L.A. in about 1984 and relocated here. When you were in Chicago, were you actually shooting in Chicago? The entertainment specials, some of them, I actually won a, gosh, actually, you know, I say I got an Emmy, but that came in, in Ohio. Um, we did a comedy show in Chicago and a children's play from the Goodman Theater in Chicago, but most of the time we were shooting wherever, like we did the Fifth Dimension at Caesars in Atlantic City. We shot the Monterey Jazz Festival at Monterey, mm. and um, so we were all over the place. 
And this is a very tough business uh, to get into. What what made you, you know, a guy from Chicago think he could uh, find a place and uh, actually make it profitable? Total fluke. No training. <laughs> no background. No money. And about 1980-81, uh, Chicago was being considered for um, franchising for cable, mm-hmm. and it was out to bids. And I had a publishing company at the time. I was doing some radio syndication, and my lawyers approached me and said, look, Chicago's going to eventually have cable. They're going to need programming. You're in radio. That's close as we know to anybody in television. Why don't we form a television company? And so hmm. literally it was the blind leading the blind. Four lawyers and myself started a company. It was originally called Chicago Teleproductions. Hmm. And um, I flew to Dallas to the National Cable you know, Convention walked around like I knew what I was talking about and um, <laughs> decided we were going to um, basically get into the film business or in the, in the, in the television business. Oh, yeah. you, know, you know what? I, I've just made a decision. I'm going to get into the, uh, the, uh, the business of writing software for PC computers. Right, and you probably know more than, <laughs> about that than I did about the film or television <laughs> industry because our first show actually that we actually produced was an absolute fluke. Um, we figured if we were going to be in the business and we had to actually produce a television show. So I flew to Los Angeles with this really great concept that we would do a 60s music revival where every all these acts from the 60s would do two songs each. You know, we had the Four Tops, uh, like Tommy Rowe, uh, Wilson Pickett. And I walked around with a piece of paper and a brochure. Literally, I, I walked in a you know, Columbia Pictures. Mm-hmm. And I... It's amazing that I got the meetings, but more amazing was that uh, I, I couldn't sell it. Uh, they, pretty much everyone said, well, when you make the show, come back, and we'll be happy to look at it. <laughs> so, so I was deflated. I went back to Chicago and canceled all the contracts to hire the, you know, the, the music acts because I was allowed a 30-day grace period before the show to cancel without penalty. And everyone allowed me to cancel except William Morris and the Four Tops. And they said, you bought the four tops, you got the four tops. And I go, but now they're the only act left. Uh, they, they only were going to do two songs. I said, that's not much of a show. Uh, the amount of money we were going to pay them was negligible. And as it turned out, we cut a deal with William Moores that the four tops would now do a one-hour show for the same amount hmm. of money. So oh. now I had a scramble, and in a matter of three weeks, um, put together the money to be, actually produce the show, uh, found a venue in Chicago that gave me a nightclub at midnight after a boxing event to be able to you know to film it. Uh, yeah. I traded out the sound, I traded out the cameras, and I think we made the show for something like twenty thousand dollars. And then I got lucky. Um, within weeks of the show being you know finished, the Four Tops signed a new record deal with Polygram Records. They had two new top ten singles, and I'm the only person who had it on tape. And so I went. <laughs> back to California, you know, with a cassette in hand, and ended up walking around trying to sell this Four Tops concert, and was reasonably successful, and I was in the business. Now, that wow. was the, the first show, and uh, it, it was exciting, and I still didn't know what I was doing, but uh, we had a show <laughs> under our belt. And how did you transition into uh, film? Well, <laughs> almost as funny a story. It was 1983. And we were now going to the, the video conventions and the television conventions in Europe. This one was some MIP. And we had all these great you know, television shows like you know, the Monterey Jazz Festival and um, a Smothers Brothers comedy show. And we were proud of them. And we had this one little acquisition called The Courier of Death. It was a shot in Portland over two and a half years with like, you know, end stocks and they couldn't they could only shoot on weekends and I mean it, it looked awful. But twenty six people died in the trailer and we walked around actually embarrassed to have it in our portfolio, but people kept coming up going, well, what's this courier of death? And to make a long story short, we couldn't give our music shows away, but we pretty much sold the courier of death everywhere in the world. <laughs> and said, Okay, we now know what the people want. Uh, I can do this. And I said, I'm going to write probably equally as, as bad of a screenplay. 
and uh, I we're going to make this movie. And that ended up becoming Armed Response, the David Carradine and Lee Van Cleef movie, which wow. was the first film we funded ourselves. And that was wow. 1985. Yeah. Do you think it was? E- do you think it was easier back then to 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 do this? I mean, or, or was it? Is it relative to the way uh, people fall into uh, the online business now? Yeah, I, I think every decade or every era is is, is equally difficult. It's just mm-hmm. different difficult. Uh, you know, we started this, this company with a thousand dollars and a dream, and that that was it. You know, now, I mean, back in the day, if you made a movie, you were always shooting 35 millimeter. Now, with HD, you know, 24P, you can make some really decent looking movies relatively inexpensively. Mm-hmm. So, it is different. You now have the internet, which is totally different, um, YouTube's of the world, and you know, people can go out there and, uh, you know, make their own little films. So, it's still difficult to break, break in, but uh, plenty of access. And tell me, how do you describe uh, your studio, your company? Is it? Is, I described it as an independent. Is that is that the best description, or do you have another way to, to explain it? Totally, uh, we're totally independent. Uh, we're actually a member of the Independent Film and Television Alliance, also known as IFTA, which runs the American film market in Santa Monica in November, mm. and it's a the organization of independent film producers and distributors, and that's we're one of them. Okay. And uh, so how, how big is your company? How many employees do you have that are actually, you know, staff? We have about 26 right now. We have an office building in Los Angeles uh, on Sunset Boulevard. We've been here for about 14 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, they'll love it, love what we do. Um, currently, we're producing most of our movies out of Vancouver just because of the subsidies and tax benefits we were able to get from the Canadian government. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, we've shot all over the world. And what do you what do you have in production at the moment? Okay, we're busy. We <laughs> just just finished a Steven Seagal film that is, was delivered last week. We have uh, four Sci-Fi Channel premieres in uh, the pipeline that are in post production right now. We're starting a brand new one called Ice Twisters, which is kind of like a tornado movie on you know crack. It's uh, <laughs> Okay. The best way to say it. it's a tornado movie, but you know, just gone really wrong. <laughs> and uh, so that one started shooting in September. Uh, we're going to be doing a Dolph Lundgren movie, which he's starring in and directing, called Icarus, mm. which is an action film about um, a hitman, and um, that shoots in November. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've recently acquired the remake rights to I Spit on Your Grave. Which was the 1978 cult classic uh, that Meyer Zarki produced and directed, and we're going to try to give a modern, you know, spin on that. I saw you've gotten a lot of uh, online attention for that. So since you mentioned it, I'll ask you here: Why on earth did anyone feel they needed to remake that movie? Well, um, if you saw <laughs> the numbers that that original movie generated, uh, you would then say this might be an interesting thing to do. Um, mm-hmm. We were approached by Meyer, uh, who still owns the original one, and he wanted to do it. I mean, it came from him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the thought is that they're going to remake it, and he's actually already written a sequel, you know, to it, and would like to see that made at, you know, some future date. Mm-hmm. The, the question is, it was really controversial 30 years ago. Right. Uh, but now, you know, with the saws and the hostels out, you know, the envelope's been pushed. Uh, so the question is, you know, can we still make it controversial? And, you know, what's going to be different and special about it? And that's the, really the problem we're facing right now. Uh, we're taking pitches from writers and directors, and we're hoping to find a story that, uh, you know, pays homage to the original and yet gives it a, a 2008 spin. Hmm. Is it is it one of those things that I've read in recent years that some movies have been remade? Uh, there have been movies that were classics but that were uh, for example, uh, uh, Psycho was made, but it was in black and white. Uh, right. And for a modern, uh, a modern audience, they want everything in color. So uh, some, some people have seen that as a reason to remake. And then there's others where, you know, they just think they can make it better or, you know, well, something like that. I mean, you know, they remade Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They remade Halloween. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you're also going to get a new generation of a viewing audience 
that you know maybe didn't see the original except you know on late night television or on a DVD that wants to see it in theaters. Mm. Uh, and again, it, it's updated. You know, there's more that you can do with you know computer graphics now and CGI that you couldn't do 30 years ago. Mm. Well, uh, and, uh, and and so let's go back to you were you were naming off. Were there were there any other fil- uh, films you wanted to mention that are in production with Cinetel right now? Oh gosh, I'm probably <laughs> looking at production <laughs> slate. Uh, so I said Ice Twisters, and and then Icarus, and then uh, we've got four new ones we're also doing for the um, the Sci-Fi Channel. We're going to be starting Stonehenge Apocalypse as well very shortly. That's one and movie. That's one movie. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and we just finished. Um, um, we do the Poison Ivy movies. And ah. Poison Ivy Four, which the world definitely needs. Uh, I believe just aired Sunday night on Lifetime. Uh huh. And so, uh, waiting to hear the, what the ratings were. And then we have another Lifetime movie called Trial by Fire that'll be airing in September, starring uh, Brooke Burns and Rex Lynn. Hmm. So, we're pretty busy. So, what. Um, does Cinetel have a formula for the kind of movies that, that bear its brand? I mean, is there. You know, it's got to have this, and it's got to have that, and it's got to have this. Yes. Uh, and it changes based on the time period that, you, mm-hmm. that you're in. You know, back in the 80s, when the video market was just booming, you, you could make pretty much anything, uh, you know, come out with a poster and with a, with a title and guns and explosions, and you'd be able to sell it around the world. Why uh, is that, by the way? Because there was many more buyers you know, than, than sellers, and mm-hmm. it was just a boom. I mean, everyone wanted to get a piece of the video marketplace. That yeah, lasted until okay. probably about 90, 91, mm-hmm. and then uh, it dried up a bit when it got saturated. Um, then in about probably 93 to 96, the erotic thriller became very popular in terms right. of direct-to-video. Uh, about 97 to... 2001 became the action you know, films and the um, military films mm-hmm. were very popular. And I would say in the last three or four years, you know, we've gone into the disaster films, the panic disaster films, and, and the sci-fi films that have done you know, extremely you know, well in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. So what we're looking to do is minimize our risk, uh, you know, maximize the potential for you know, return on investment, and you know, have fun doing it, making something that you know is entertaining. Hmm. And I, I may be. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, nope, no, nope, you're first. I was going to say I may have interrupted you answering my own question about uh, kind of a formula for what you, what it needs to have. You're saying you know, depending on the era. Well, here's what we're doing. So we told you that, you know the genre changed, but the formula pretty much stayed the same, which for us was um, a combination of pre-sales where we do our own international distribution. So we go to film markets, we travel the world, and, um, excuse me, <clears throat> we'll talk to our buyers and find out what they want. And so having done it for so long, we have a steady you know, supply of you know, distributors that we work with around the world. So, for example, most of our movies are with TF1 in France. Uh, you know, they might be with, like, you know, Telecinco or Quattro in Spain or with, you know, Eagle or Rye in Italy with mm-hmm. New Select in Japan. So we go to them with, you know, regularly, and we know what they're willing to buy and what they're willing to pay. Um, domestically, you know, on home video, we've been with uh, Columbia TriStar, uh, Sony, uh, New Line, Lionsgate, and now, you know, First Look. And we try to do TV premieres. So where we can get a company like HBO, which we did you know, in the past, uh, the Sci-Fi Channel, or Lifetime, to come in and commit to a concept. And by them doing that, then you know, we knew that you know, we've eliminated some of the risk. And therefore, we go out and make the movie. We'll fund everything ourselves. And uh, you know, know that we're making it for a specific buyer. In this case, like I said, you know, Ogre was for the Sci-Fi Channel. Loch Ness was for the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, Trial by Fire and Poison Ivy is for a lifetime. So it's just a matter of finding you know, your niche, uh, knowing who's looking for certain kind of films, and then um, developing what they want. Mm. You know, sci-fi has always liked the, uh, the creature films. And, th- and they were doing okay overseas and okay here. Uh, we tried to convince them that you know, disaster films 
might work better. And we sp- did one on spec where we actually funded it ourselves without pre-selling it to them. It was called Earthstorm. And they aired it last year. It did well. And that allowed us to do more disaster, you know, panic disaster type films for them, which have a very good worldwide wide appeal. So right now, that's like our number one movie. Uh, hmm. Well, let me let me interrupt you here, and let's give everybody a taste of one of those movies. This is the uh, it's audio only, but it's the uh, it's from the uh, teaser for Shockwaves. Okay. You want us to chop her in and retrieve a couple of robots? That's correct, gentlemen. Sir, just what kind of robots are we looking for here? Designed to kill. They're equipped with lasers, infrared cameras, and a rolling arsenal of weapons. Programmed to obey. Very smart and capable of learning from their experience. Built to survive. Any ordinance you could carry wouldn't even penetrate their armor. But now, the perfect weapon is out of control. Gear it up, check weapons. And there is just 24 hours to retrieve them. Move. One day to live or die. If they don't hear back from us that the robots have been neutralized, they're going to nuke this whole little garden spot into eternity. Take that thing out! Joe Lando. Michael Dorn. You know the orders. Alexandra Paul. Shockwave. <laughs> okay. I love that stuff. I could, Classic. I could, I would buy, I would buy a sixty-minute uh, DVD that was just trailers. And you guys seem to do trailers just great. Yeah, we've had good success with our trailers. And it's funny, you know, we sit here, and you, you would enjoy you know, the creative process because we sit around like a table or at lunch and come up with what we have, our chart O disaster. And <laughs> it's, like, it's like to the point of mixing and matching. Okay, we've got you know, natural disasters. We have man-made disasters. And what haven't we done? And what, you know, what can we do to you know, expand the horizon here? And after so many years of doing this, it's getting tougher. You know, coming up with something that's fresh and new. And uh, you know, I think Stonehenge, which Apocalypse, which is coming out, was based on the premise what if Stonehenge was really a bomb and that the pyramids were like the detonators? And from that concept came, okay, we've got to come up with a story now. So uh, and that's what we're working on, and that will be shooting in a, few, in a couple months. But, you know, again, it's like you know, pushing the envelope to what haven't you seen, right. uh, taking something like Stonehenge, which everyone knows what Stonehenge is, and we're going to find a, you know, a dead body there that they're going to remove, and as they do the digging, they notice that, that underneath Stonehenge there's metal and that maybe it's been there for you know, 6,000 years and things happen when people start playing with things they shouldn't touch. <laughs> and so that's, that's how the movie starts. I'm so, thinking it would, be, it would be fun to be a writer working for you. Uh, just, I'm just, you know. Well, I'll tell you, our office has fun coming up with the concepts because, you know, there's really no, no, no such thing as a stupid or silly concept because, well, well they're all silly, you know, <laughs> one way or another. So, uh, you know, throw it out there. We're um, come someone, and we do a lot of research on the Internet. Uh, one of our employees went on the Internet and found out about this lost civilization that uh, was discovered by archaeologists, and there was something called the Curse Stone, that they believed, you know, killed them. And so we said, Curse Stone, what a cool idea for a movie. <laughs> and the Curse Stone basically became, now these archaeologists find this, you know, deserted you know, area and a lost civilization. And when they read the stone, they read, like, five disasters that befell them that caused the end of their civilization. But as they keep on reading, there's, well, three more that haven't happened yet. Mm. And by uncovering it, they set it in motion, the new disasters. And we got that right off, I mean, the basic idea came off the Internet. Uh, just reading a story about, you know, a lost civilization. And that also will be a sci-fi um, premiere. I think it's called the Doomsday Scrolls. Wow. Yeah. And so do you have, uh, I'm guessing you probably don't have writers on staff, but you have people on staff who kick around ideas and then kick out the ideas and, and everyone uh, everyone pretty much in the office can get involved in the story concepts 
we have a development department headed up by Neil Elman, and who's also a writer. So mm-hmm. it helps, and uh, and he's got a staff, and you know my partner Lisa Hansen, who's in charge of uh, the physical production, and myself you just sit around and you know we brainstorm, and then we pitch the ideas, and if they they sell, we make the movies. Hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Now, um, he's, he's one of the a real job, you know. <laughs> and that's what I say about what I do. Yeah. <laughs> One of the common elements that I notice is that you, you tend to have a uh, a familiar uh, face or two or three. Uh, in uh, Shockwave, it was uh, for me. It was Michael Dorn, who was Worf on uh, Star Trek, and of course Alexander Paul from uh, Baywatch. Um, you have, uh, I know you've had a film that uh, Academy Award winner Louis Gossett Jr. Jr. was in. Yep. How, how important are those uh, faces and names? Uh, maybe not so, I'm guessing probably not so much to the American market as the overseas market. Actually, both. Uh, huh. I mean, the Sci Fi Channel cares who's in the movie. Of course, they like some of the sci fi pedigree. But the DVD marketplace in the United States, it's also important. We just finished one called Termination Point that. Uh, actually just aired as a sci-fi premiere in July and starred uh, Lou Diamond Phillips and Jason Priestley. Mm. And that helped us get a, you know, a video DVD you know, deal at Sony. And uh, you know, it, it helped sell the movie all around the world as well. So TV friendly is very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, this new one with uh, Trial by Fire for Lifetime is Brooke Burns and his new TV series coming out and Rex Lynn from CSI Miami. So we're looking for recognizable faces, at the very least, if not names. And uh, what kind of budget do these films have? Well, to quote a very good friend of mine who sells movies, they're somewhere between a dollar and twenty-five million. <laughs> we, we really don't talk much about budgets, um, right? Because the, the problem in this industry, everyone lies. So mm-hmm. if you let's say you really spend you know four million. But someone who spent two million says they spent five million. You look mm-hmm. bad. Yeah, uh, they're they're not cheap because at least with our movies we're dealing a lot with special effects and CGI. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're spending you know well over several million dollars per film. Okay, and I mean for an, for an actor who maybe you know some of these actors their, their names are familiar, but maybe they're. Their better, their bigger days are behind them. Their bigger paydays are behind them. Are they are they working for for a piece of the future earnings of the film? Are they do they work for uh, a flat rate? Uh, you know how does how well, does that most, work? Most most of them, at least you know for us, are not. They're not working for a you know, piece of the future revenues. They want their money okay. now. Okay. I, I don't blame them. No, nobody wants net points. So hmm. um, you know they, they get their money. They get it now and then. Pretty much all of them are screen actor guild actors, so they're going to get residuals too. So depending on how the movie performs, they'll see extra money through their residuals. I see. Um, you know, I almost I sometimes I get so wrapped up in, uh, in talking to my guests myself that I forget to give out our phone number. So if you're listening and you've got a question for Paul Hertzberg, uh, president and CEO of Cinetel Films, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you or hear from you. Six four six five nine five three one three five. And, of course, that's only if you're listening to us live uh, July 30th, 2008. Uh, if, uh, if, if, we've, if the show's over, you can't call us. Paul is out, uh, you know, probably having, uh, having dinner with uh, Alexander Paul, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm raking leaves in the backyard. Okay, so, you know. Um, actually, actually, tonight's poker night, so I'm having it with the producer of Saving Grace. But <laughs> Oh, very good. Yeah. Oh, name dropping. Good, good, good. Oh, totally. Well, you can name drop, so can I. <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, are, there any, uh, are, there, are there any actors or actresses who have shown up more often than others in your films? Back in the 90s, we worked with Leo Rossi a lot. Uh, Leo was in our Relentless series of movies. I think mm-hmm. he did four for us before he begged us to kill him in the last one. <laughs> uh, you know, to serious money. Um, so that was Leo. Um, gosh, we worked with Lou Diamond Phillips several times, probably three or four times now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Dolph will be on number two. 
Uh, we worked with Mario Van People several times. Uh, we've made about 150 movies, so I'm it's kind of tripping down memory lane here, you know, trying to go mm. over my head. Uh, anytime we have a good experience with someone, we're happy to work with them again. Uh, and and it's, and it's fun. And it makes a lot of sense to work with people that you know, you know, easy to work with, good actors. Uh, and then it's also fun to meet new people, too. Mm. So, you know, we would love to work with them. Like I said, you know, working with Dolph's a good experience. We would love to work with them again. Do you do you often with uh, these actors, who, and you don't know before you get them maybe, but, you know, some monstrous uh, egos who are like, you know, uh, you know, this has to be done this way. I, I know what I'm saying, you know, uh, that kind of well, that kind that of, other, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And what we try to do is that if, you know, certain actors have a reputation, mm-hmm. we try to find that out in advance just to avoid it. Because you're always working on tight schedules, and you don't need prima donnas or people who are difficult. So if at all possible, we try to pre-screen and find out whether it's from other directors, other actors, you know, the film insurance companies and bond companies, you know, who's easy to work with and who's not. And that helps in you know, determining you know, who we eventually hire. Also, hmm. uh, so we do, we do, re- we do research. Yeah. <laughs> Have there been people who do not get invited back? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I can't tell you. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> can't tell you. Come on! There's, yeah. there's nobody. Li- there's nobody listening. It's just yeah. you and me. Nobody. Yeah. Nobody will ever hear this. I'm, I'm sure. And you know what? Yeah. I would love to tell you. <laughs> so, you know, call me when you hang up, and I'll be happy to give you a list. <laughs> All right. Actually, the All list right. isn't well, that long, but uh, someone um, that we've just recently worked with is you know, someone we won't be working with again. Ah, okay. <laughs> and it's one of the 50 names I've mentioned in the last you know, 20 minutes. Okay. So I'll leave it at that. All right, very interesting. <laughs> and, and, and don't guess. Uh, I won't. I, I really. I will not. I, I don't want to. Uh, but it, it's it's sad because you know you're you're you you want to get along with everybody and you want to have a, a positive experience. And when someone comes in for whatever you know reason, and it could be something in their personal life or whatever, and they're just not into it or give you difficulty, it just makes the job less than enjoyable. Hmm. What um, um, you know? What element does sex or play in your movies? <laughs> <laughs> I had a really funny answer. I was like, um, lately, very little. Uh, hmm. In fact, I was just having lunch with an actress today who's going to be doing a movie, and they wanted her to have a sex and nude part. And you know, we were talking about the merits of it, of how it would help her career or not help her career. And she's deciding it, you know, tonight if she's going to do it or not. You know, with few exceptions. Like, for example, we do the I mentioned the Poison Ivy series. Mm-hmm. Which is about you know black widows and there's a lot of sex you know in you know the show, so there that movie had nudity. Um, mm-hmm. I can't think of another movie we've done in the last ten years that had nudity in it. We we tend not to. It's not mm-hmm. necessary. You know, our people are looking for action, good story, suspense, special effects, um, and for television, for the most part, we we have to cut it out anyway. Ah. You know, it's not going to air on basic cable or on syndication, so you're going to need cover shots. And it, with rare exceptions, you know, it's not it's not meaningful for the stories. Mm. It's, it's meaningful. Well, exactly. What's wrong yeah. with that? I'm I'm off Absolutely, that. absolutely nothing. And you then go out and buy Poison Ivy. You know, <laughs> it's just coming out. The Lifetime version is PG, and uh, New Line Warner Brothers will have the DVD. Um, extra version uh, mm-hmm. out, uh, I think, in October. Well, uh, you provided me another segue here. Uh, I want to ask you about Lifetime movies, but first, I'm guessing this is a Lifetime movie. I want to play a uh, trailer for Secret Lives of Second Wives, which I enjoyed. Uh, here we go. Wait, wait, hold up. You're living where he lived with his ex? Yeah, but just temporarily. You cannot trust him. I have a wonderful husband. No, I met Jack while I was rushing home to make dinner. A new love. Our honeymoon was the most peaceful time. Now the honeymoon is way over. It is not. He hasn't even carried me over the threshold yet. A new family. Second wives have it hard. It's nothing to worry about. What we get in life. There it was. Perfect dream home for our new life together. Isn't always what we choose. 
She wants your husband back. And his children are probably in on it. Hey, guys, you can come on in. It's all good. He wants to move back into the house. It's just temporary, just till he finds a job. An eight-course meal with wine for 350 guests. Plus right. or minus. You know, you mentioned that we should uh, go over the finances for the wedding. 40000 Give or take. She's my baby. You're not willing to ask your daughter to scale back her unrealistic wedding expectations, but you are willing to break your promise about us buying a dream house together. Everything okay? Yeah. What did you think of Alex? He's hot, huh? Alex is a very creative engineer. I would hate to think that I'm the kind of woman who'd have an affair out of spite. Jack is practically driving you into someone else's arms. It's not spitefulness or weakness to admit you have sneezed. Bad and fair. You slept with someone? Welcome to the club. The Second Wives Club. Secret Lives of Second Wives. If you can survive each other's families, you can survive anything. <laughs> now, that movie has great casting and, I mean, very timely casting. I think that's a 2007 production that's uh, Andrea Roth who uh, is the uh, uh, spouse on um, Rescue Me, yep. and, right? and uh, Brian McNamara, who is one of the leads on Army Wives on Lifetime. Right. Now, that happens to be a movie that we did not produce, but we handled the international distribution on. Okay. Um, our producing partner in Vancouver, Insight Pictures, actually produced that film. Okay. Quite, you know, I, I love the title. Absolutely love the title, and, and it's, a, it's a very provocative uh and it's kind of funny. I don't know if the movie is funny, but the, the trailer is, is, is kind of funny. Um, it, it may not be a funny movie. I don't know. No, it's not. It's okay. not it was not intended to be. <laughs> and and no, sorry, did that, it well, I, you know, <laughs> I, well, when they toast the new member of the uh, I've Cheated on My Husband Club, it, I thought maybe yeah. it's a funny movie. Yeah. I, I guess, guess if plus you're the one being cheated on, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, no, but that was supposed to be a lifetime, you know, drama slash thrill- thriller. Hmm. And that's what uh, they were known for doing for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And I can say that Lifetime has actually recently shifted their focus uh, from doing those, you know, women in jeopardy and and straight women thriller movies to a more varied um, type of programming, which includes, you know, true crime. Uh, true stories. Uh, you know, we like I said, we even got them to do uh, two disaster films. One was called Storm Cell with Mimi Rogers, and you know, the next one was Trial by Fire about female smoke jumpers. And hmm. that's the Brooke Burns movie that'll be airing in September. Well, and they're riding a crest right now with Army Wives. I know yep. uh, we had uh, uh, producer uh, Catherine Fuge was on uh, just uh, I don't know, it seems like a month or two ago, and. Uh, uh, so will you be doing more for them, do you think? Possibly. You know, it depends on how the ratings go. Uh, we, like I said, we had Poison Ivy that is it's airing now, and then when um, Raging, sorry, Trial by Fire airs, if the ratings do good and that genre works, then I'm sure we'll be doing more from. We're talking to them, but there's nothing committed at the present time. Mm-hmm. Um, Paul, how important are outlets such as uh, Blockbuster and Netflix to your business model? Well, we don't sell directly. Um, we go through a distributor, like for example, like Lionsgate or First Look. And, right. But they're important for them. Like for example, First Look and Lionsgate both have output deals. You know that their product will be carried by Blockbuster. So, um, and Blockbuster being you know a very large source of revenue, uh, you, you need it in your mix if you want to be successful. Hmm. Do you, uh, you know, are you ever aware of? Do you ever get feedback from uh, the, the the people at Netflix or Blockbuster about what they're looking for, or what's working, what's not working? Well, that information goes to you know, Lionsgate. Dean, Dean, Dean Wilson at First Look. You know, that okay. goes to Steve Beeks over at Lionsgate, and then they disseminate that information down to other people. And you know, we talk to them to see like what actors' movies are performing, and which ones aren't. Because hmm. if you put an actor in a film that isn't performing or hasn't performed recently, then they're not going to want to pick up the film. Okay. Interesting. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, too, about the type of studio that you operate. Um, I wondered what, uh, in the history of film, what studios you might feel have been your 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 counterparts, and not necessarily your contemporaries right now, but 
Uh, I mean, I was thinking Roger Corman, but maybe you had other examples. Well, Roger's a friend. Um, okay. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, um, a lot of the owners of independent film companies are, are very good friends. In fact, you know, a number of them are, we're all in a wine tasting group together. So you've got you know, people like Avi Lerner and New Image, uh, Pierre David at Imagination, um, you know, Stephen Paul with Crystal Sky. Uh, there, there's just a, a number of companies that um, we all do similar things. You know, mm-hmm. Roger Car- Carmen has a niche of a certain budget level, typically lower, uh, and, but he's like an icon in the industry. You know, Avi, which started out doing you know genre and action films, has now you know graduated. And he's doing you know De Niro, Pacino films and coming out theatrically. So mm-hmm. it's um, the one thing I say is you know there's room for everybody, and you know, it, it's a great business to be in. As difficult well, then, as it is, it's still a lot of fun. <laughs> and it, it sounds like you're in it, uh, yeah, obviously to make a profit, but also that you enjoy it a great deal. Yeah. Um, but, you know, besides the genre films, and I think my partner would shoot me if I didn't you know, mention this, you, yes, the bread and butter is you know, our action films, our disaster films, but every now and then we like to sneak in a drama and a serious movie that hopefully would get critical acclaim and something we care about. Uh, and we've done probably about six or seven of those through the years. Uh, usually they don't make money, but something that we're, you know, we're proud that you know, we actually did. Hmm. Like We did Will Smith's first film, you know, which was called Where the Day Takes You, that Mark Rocco directed. And we had this great all-star cast, uh, you know, Laura Flynn Boyle, Dermot Mulroney, you know, Christian Slater, uh, Sean Astin. Uh, Ricky Lake, uh, you know, Nancy McKeon, you know, Alyssa Milano, David Arquette, uh, Will Smith, uh, mm-hmm. among others, in this film about runaways and, and you know, kids in Los Angeles and homeless kids called Where the Day Takes You that was critically acclaimed, unfortunately, you know, didn't make an awful lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did a movie called The Rumor of Angels with Vanessa Redgrave and Ray Liotta and Catherine McCormick and Trevor Morgan that MGM released, you know, about four years ago. Again, Good reviews, you know, didn't do the business. So we do, we do those as well. Well, and I, you, it's funny, you were, you were going where I was just going to ask you about, uh, you know, when award time comes around in, in Hollywood, uh, you know, and then now, of course, the Independent Spirit uh, Awards are very big, uh, as, of course, the Academy Awards, the Golden Globes. Uh, you know, is there a pang, you know, is there a pang in, in, your, in your gut when, when all that stuff's going on, feeling like, you know, we could be producing more movies that are that are get that kind of attention. Or I mean, you, you said that you know you do occasionally do that. Um, you know, do you want to do more of that? Is it not a big deal? If we could do it in such a way that it was commercially feasible as well as artistically, absolutely. Mm-hmm. The key is to find the project that would be you know embraced on a creative level that still has a commercial side to it, because typically. If you're doing a genre or you're doing an art film, if it doesn't work theatrically, it's not going to work in in the ancillaries on DVD or in television. And therefore, whatever you spend to make the the movie, you're probably going to lose a lot of it. Hmm. Is there a... You need deep pockets or you need to be very careful. Hmm. Is there a a film uh, the last couple of years... uh, that fit that that fits into the type of movies that you do that you wish you had done or maybe you passed on and wish you you know <laughs> wish you had. Um, not that we passed on. What would I love to have made? Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I mean, there's so many good movies that are out there. Ah, yeah, of course, you know. The Dark Knight would have been nice. Let's we'll see, that's like <laughs> only at five hundred million right now. Um, no, gosh, that's a that's a really good question because I actually have so many movies that I've really like just enjoyed. I mean, last year's you know, Live Free or Die Hard was like one of my favorite movies of the year. You know, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, so that was a fun ride. But then again, you know, a few years ago, I really enjoyed Moulin Rouge. Yeah, mm. but, but that was well done. You know, but I'm thinking in terms of movies that are, you know, kind of in the budget that you work within for your average okay, movie sure. that, that yeah. other people have made or, you know, is okay. there anything? Yeah, I can give you one. It's, okay. I won't say it's embarrassing, but uh, 
I am good friends with Mark Berg, who is the producer of Saw. And uh, Mark and I actually share Clippers season basketball tickets together. And a few years ago, Mark was funding Saw, and things were running tight. And, uh, you know, he decided actually, I think, you know, they they went into debt, him and his partner Oren, to actually make the movie, which they did and was very successful. And uh, they've made an absolute bloody fortune. (laughs) And at one point, you know, Mark came up to me and said, if I had offered you a piece of it, would you put up the money? And I looked at him and said, "Mm, probably not. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, there was the honest answer that probably cost me hundreds of millions of dollars. (laughs) Oh, my. Is there there a movie in your group, the 150, 160 movies that you've made, that has been, you know, the big movie for the company over the years? In terms of credibility, it was, you know, Where the Day Takes You, which Mm -hmm. it was the Will Smith film. Uh, right. In terms of profits, probably the R- Relentless, which went out theatrically and spawned you know, three sequels. Mm-hmm. Um, and recently, you know, it's kind of if I can make a baseball analogy. We, we hit a lot of singles and doubles, but not a lot of home runs. Mm-hmm. So we're not striking out a lot. You know, most of the movies, you know, make a little bit of money. Okay. And that covers the overhead and gives you a chance to get up to the plate and you know maybe you'll get you you lucky in the future. Um, I want to play another uh, another clip. This is uh, this is from a movie that I think is a little bit different for for you. Uh, and maybe we can talk about this afterward. This is um, this is uh, Aussie and Ted, which stars uh, uh, Dean, <laughs> Dean Cain from from the old Superman uh, yeah. Lois and Clark show. Uh, let's uh, let's give a listen to this, and then we can talk about it for a minute or two. I have something very special for Ling. Wow, a uh, teddy bear. One of a kind. This gift will bring your family much light. Oh wow, he's so cute. A new friend. No way, he glows. Look at that, he is glowing. An old pal feeling lost. Lainey used to show me off to her friend. Now all she thinks about is that stinky teddy bear. I was just wondering how long you plan on suffering like this, Aussie boy. Don't listen to him. Now, one jealous moment. I made a silly mistake and I took it away from her. Will become the adventure of a lifetime. I can't find Ted. I've got to find that bear. No! He's gone! I'm doomed! Ah! There you are. Whoa. Hang in there, mate. No worries. Whoa. Wait, come back. Uh-oh, what am I going to do? Yeah, I think I got something. Someone is looking for me. Say bye boy to the teddy bear, because you're never going to see him again. I'm not going to let you down, teddy bear. Come here, quick, take a look at this. She caught these images of a dog carrying a teddy bear in his mouth. Closing in on Dean Kane. Ozzy will be a lot easier to find as he's a TV star. And Beverly D'Angelo. It can only be one of four things. Chicken poop, horse poop, cow poop, or bull poop. Ozzy and Ted. Nothing can stop us now. So we, we, I think we need to explain for anyone listening that uh, the two uh, two of the voices there were not. It wasn't a leprechaun. It was a it was the, huh. the dog uh, and uh, the little bear, uh, little teddy stuffed animal, kind of spoke. Um, well, so you can hear its feelings because it glows when it feels love. Oh, is that what? Is that how? It, okay. Yeah. Now this you, this you, film was produced, I think, by a foundation, right? Actually, a very good friend of mine named Shuki Levy, who was a partner of Haim Saban and Saban Entertainment, and had a you know background in you know children's you know films as well, you know, got involved, and he has a foundation. Then he funded this himself because he wanted to make a movie that you know his daughter would enjoy and uh, aimed at you know a young audience. You know, the average age probably for this is probably from like five to twelve, and it's a good wholesome story. The movie is just about finished. It's going to be delivered in about the next two weeks. Mm. And uh, it's very cute and very different from what we've done. 
and we and hope he does really well with it. What is the distribution channel for this? It's a little different, isn't it? Well, well right now, you know, I don't believe it's going to be theatrical in the United States, so it's going to be DVD uh, and you know, television. So the you know, question becomes, you know, is it Animal Planet? Is it you know, ABC Family? You know, is it the Disney Channel? Is it you know, Stars Family? You know, so that's to be seen, and it should play on DVD everywhere because I would think the WalMarts of the world would love to have a film like this, mm-hmm. family friendly. And overseas, we announced it at the Cannes Film Festival this year, and it uh, actually was very, very well received. Uh, we found out, you know, one surprising thing, kind of an anecdote, and that is. Um, Dog movies, especially talking dog movies, are very popular in Turkey, and we had a bidding <laughs> war to get the Turkey television rights. <laughs> so, uh, and, and they paid uh, more than twice what we were getting from our action disaster films. Wow! So there you go. You know, so you learn you learn something new every day. Well, I I, I know we, in our house we love the movie Dogs and Cats. That, that's not this exactly, but you know, talking dogs, you just can't beat them. It's cute. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's got Dean Cain and uh, Beverly Perfect. D'Angelo. Yeah, and uh, it's a very sweet film. Yeah, well, so um, we'll, we'll do more. <laughs> um, really, just one other thing I wanted to ask you about: um, the the uh, industry is always changing, of course. But there is a movement, although it, it seems to be a slower one than than some people would like, to uh, digital movies, uh, 3D movies, and, and more IMAX. And I wondered if, if, uh, if the greater uh, demands of technology and the greater opportunities of technology affects uh, a company like yours now or if you think it will in the next couple of years. Yes and no. I mean, is it affecting us now? No. Uh, okay. Will the IMAX side or 3D side? Not at all. If, if that's where it goes, we could easily you know, do it as well. It costs more. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of digital, when we shoot for the Sci-Fi Channel, uh, they require us to use 35 millimeter because they want their the air that shows that air on their network to have a uniform look, and it's got a nice rich look. Uh, when we've shot for Lifetime, they're okay with HD. So it, as that technology gets better in terms of how it looks, is it's kind of hard to you know hide you know you know facial flaws, for example. Mm-hmm. HD is so you know, crystal sharp that um, if the technology gets to a point where it's uh, better and less expensive, then you'll be seeing more and more people having access to make movies because the price to shoot is going to go down. Mm. Not, you know, and that's a plus for everybody. Okay. Very good. Well, um Folks, you can learn more about uh, Cinetel Films by visiting uh, the company's website uh, at www.cinetelfilms.com. That I'll spell that. It's one one word in the URL. It's C I N E T E L F I L M S dot com. And uh, Paul, just for you, I want to play one last thing. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I hope I'm current with that. I believe that is the Cinetel sound at the beginning of all of your films. Our logo? I yeah. Could be. I didn't recognize it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, it's that internet recording. We do the best we can. Yeah. Um, we just have a new one. So you could be totally right. We just changed our logo about um, six months ago. Oh, well, I, you know, I, I could be behind, too. You, know, you never know. I, was here it, I thought it was... Was the logo rainbow colored, or was it kind of a white crystal kind of look? I want to say it was rainbow colored. That's the old one. Yeah, sorry. No, well, I thought I was throwing you a bone there. Well, but now, now all you have to do is go to the website, you'll see the new one. <laughs> all right. Well, we may. Uh, we. May, I tell you what. To make up for that, we'll go out in a in, in a minute or so. Uh, I'll play the uh, the trailer from uh, Loch Ness Terror, which I thought was hysterical. Excellent. Um, <laughs> but Paul, anyway, I just want to uh, thank you very much. It was a, well, it was a great you. hour. It went by very quickly, and uh, I wish you uh, continued luck with the films. Great, and uh, look forward to talking to you sometime in the future as well. That'd be Thanks great. Thanks you. very much for coming on. Well, have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. So for uh, dozens more celebrity and uh, media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main website. That's uh, 
course, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my conversations with the stars, writers, and producers of Heroes, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Army Wives, 24, The Big Bang Theory, Pearls Before Swine, Tell Me You Love Me, The Dark Knight, and many others. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Digital Journal, Blueberry, Zencast, Odeo, or iTunes. Thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate when you take a little bit of time out of your day to spend it with us. Hope to talk to you and uh, hear from you very soon. Bye, everybody. We think some sort of predator may have gotten into the lake. I saw it, and I know where it lives, and this time I'm going to prove it. I'm a cryptozoologist. Study animals? Unknown species. I'll have to see his remains to help you find out what killed him. Find what? A killer dinosaur? The little lake that you love so dearly is about to become a feeding ground for a race of carnivorous prehistoric reptiles.